Salendra Draconi, A Novel Perspective of the Psychology of Warfare. Episode 1, The Anacron Campaign. Chapter 4, How It Happened. While the men of the marketplace continued to place their bets or offered a loan of Yuzhakonia so that the others can place theirs, the women around them argued amongst themselves as to whether the princess's dress was silver or light blue, as it appeared to be either color simultaneously, depending on the angle of reflection of sunlight off the fabric relative to the observer. Selindra liked to call this phenomenon Schrodinger's fabric. Simultaneously, two of the dragons argued intensely yet furtively through dragon speak about how they would get past the castle gates and the third reflected upon all possible definitions of the word beast. Suddenly, all of the assembled crowd were treated to the sound of a heavy wooden object sliding against metal. The right half of the large wooden door was slowly open, and the visitors were delighted by the sight of a proper castle guard knight, the appearance of whom was described in chapter 1. But quite unlike the friendly demeanor of the one-eyed blacksmith's apprentice, this one was a gruff and cantankerous old fool and very much unlike the absolutely incompetent and exceptionally overweight guards, the guard knight, a rather seasoned and experienced sergeant major, was tall, thin, and athletically toned. With his squinting eyes and his frowning bearded mouth, he looked just as fearsome as ready as a heavy bell ended bunderbless, which he had shoved between the bars of the portcullis and ported precariously in Budodar's general direction. Who are you? he demanded. What do you want? Speak quick like, or I swear to Almighty Todd I'll plant this shot right between your eyes! Markodar answered, begging your pardon, Sergeant. The Sergeant Major suddenly sifted his position and pointed the gun at Markodar. What do you want? You better have proper business at this here castle. General or not, I swear that I'll shoot those pointed elf ears right off your goddamn head. This remark caused one of the villagers to moan. He wanted to bet that the tall one was an elf. Hearing this remark, the guard knight pointed the musket in the man's direction, but was shocked to discover that the business end of the weapon was now pointed directly at Solyndra. Oh, begging your pardon, of course, madam. The sergeant major remarked as he lifted a free hand to tilt his tricorn hat, then placed a fierce expression back on his face and shifted the gun back to Markadar. We have come here bearing a message for King Tobias, Markadar explained. He began his statement calmly enough, but his blood was starting to boil. I order you to open this gate at once. The guard knight snorted derisively. You may be a general, I'll grant you that, he answered, but you certainly ain't a guard knight general, so I'm not obliged to follow your orders. But he briefly considered that generals of different armies may have long, drawn-out conversations about the future of a certain sergeant major's career, particularly whether he should be allowed to stay that rank, so he corrected his demeanor. Well, let's just see that message of yours. Solyndra and Markadar glanced at each other and presumably exchanged information with each other via dragon speak. Brutodar just stared at the guard knight's weapon and presumably tried to figure out the purpose of a large metal stake attached to a wooden handle. Solyndra then reached into a small bag at the waist and procured a folded handwritten piece of paper, which she then handed to the guard knight. The sergeant major then unfolded the paper and read the message. The sergeant major furrowed his brow in confusion, and then called another soldier, Private Dennis Lady, to read the note. Lady simply shrugged his shoulders dismissively. Looks official enough, the sergeant major declared, then handed the note back to the princess. Give me a moment and I'll open the porticles for you. The guard knights then stepped back, purportedly to finally get the gate open. But Budodar, not willing to wait another paragraph, dropped his hammer and cracked the pavement a second time, grabbed the bottom of the gate, and once again pulled the iron bars upwards. This time, however, the porticles slipped free from the scudding rud and became wedged in place above Budodar's head. Without another word of instruction, he walked through the open side of the wooden doors and paced menacingly towards the sergeant major. The guard knight pulled the trigger of his gun, but it only answered with a quiet metallic click. His eyes grew wide in shock, and he realized that he had forgotten to load his weapon. While Brutodar paused just long enough to laugh at him, the sergeant major quickly bit off the top of a small paper cartridge in order to load his blunderbuss, and the private just stood there slack-jawed and nervous, not quite certain what to do. Brutodar lurched forward and rinsed the gun from the sergeant major's hands, causing him to swallow a bit of the gunpowder. Looking straight into the soldier's eyes, he twisted and bent the metal barrel into a pretzel shape without the smallest iota of effort, and threw the gun to the side. The blunderbuss crashed into a low stone ledge and broke apart into tiny pieces. The sergeant major, seeing no other viable option, simply screamed like a little sissy schoolgirl and ran away in fright. As Brutodor walked back to retrieve his small, he noticed Private Lady poking his head around the corner of the castle wall. Bulodar calmly picked up his hammer and walked towards the castle gates, holding his weapon in a ready position. 
towering over the young private. He could not help but notice a line of warm yellow liquid that had run down the inside of the soldier's knee breeches and collected in a pool underneath his boots. He then looked at the private inquisitively, assuming of course he even knew the meaning of the word. The soldier nervously shook his eyes this way and that, and pointed towards the thick ceramic cup resting on the stone ledge behind him. Spilt my tea, he explained. Brudar shrugged slightly and yelled, Thirsty feast! Of course, he did not know what Thursday was, or what the bloody hell it had to do with a feast, so he simply substituted a word that seemed to fit better. Shaking violently, let us be nice to the young man and assume that it was out of nervousness and not out of fear. The private gingerly pointed his finger up and to the right. The general direction was across the castle courtyard, past a large stone water fountain which was partially frozen on that cold early winter afternoon, and to a large building at the top of a short flight of wide gray stone stairs. G Great Hall, he explained. Markadar, who had walked with Slender through the castle gates, noticed the private's hand in the direction it was pointed. Much obliged, of course, sir, he said to the guard knight. The private snapped to attention and saluted, bringing his hands across his chest and bowing slightly, as was their army's custom. Yes, sir. Welcome to Case Farage. Markadar returned his salute and then addressed the villagers, who were at that point wandering into the open castle gates. You people might not want to enter the castle, he warned. Things are about to get quite dangerous. The women started murmuring amongst themselves and walked back outside the gates. The men of the marketplace just stood there and awaited for their instructions. How dangerous, one of them asked. Markadar gave the men a confused look and was starting to find that they all simply stood there awaiting the old bell's explanation. We have it on good authority that this castle may come under dragon attack. Dragons? The man replied as he eyed Slender suspiciously. His hand meanwhile found the hilt of a hidden dagger. It seems that they are already here. Solyndra's light blue eyes turned red with anger and they lit up like fire as he prepared to attack. Markodar, in an attempt to defuse the situation, approached the villagers, a large number of whom were now armed with swords, knights, clubs, and crossbows, all withheld in the ending explanation as to where they found them. One of them, a tall hairy man in a plaid kilt, was using the point of his tagger to clean the dirt beneath his fingernails, possibly because Colby MacDonald did not think that he looked menacing enough otherwise. After all, no true Scotsman would allow his castle to be invaded. You do know that the blue dragons are on your side, do you not? Markodar answered quietly. A most nervous, yet apparently ready villager asks, So who do you suppose will be attacking us? That would be the green dragons. Ah yes, the man reminded his fellow villagers, the Presidian dragons. Correct, sir, Markodar replied, somewhat surprised that he knew even that much. Pray do tell, Master Elf, said a local butcher who was holding a freshly sharpened meat cleaver. But would this be a specific credible threat of an imminent attack on the castle, or is it more along the lines of a general threat which may occur sometime in the near future? Another man explained, We need to know which force protection stance to use in accordance with the guidance of the Ministry of King of Peacefulness, which is rather ironically named if you think about it. The only thing I am permitted to say, Markadar replied, is that some type of attack may happen somewhere at this castle at some time within the next chapter or so. Maybe. So be ready. As the villagers conversed amongst themselves that this was far more information than the ministry normally provided, the dragons took their leave of them and started their journey past the partially frozen circular fountain, up the stone stairs, and towards the great hall of the castle. In the hall, the king and his nobles were engaged in quite a vibrant discussion concerning the marriages and family life of the peasantry. The question arose of whether the nobles ought to continue to allow the common law air sauce marriages between lower class people, or if they should allow commoners to officially marry with the benefited clergy. After all, they reasoned with the other noblemen likewise assembled, if the nobility were to properly recognize their marriages, and by extension the crown itself assented to such a union, the most assuredly would immediately curtail the nobles' inherent ability to control the lives of their people. How can a baron, for example, who had just been dealt a bad poker hand and lacked the nerves of iron necessary to bluff his way out of it, then freely choose to transfer a random peasant to the estate of another to satisfy the stakes, perhaps even clear on the other end of the kingdom, without fear that he must also move the peasant's family and children? If the man is not properly married, then the argument is moved as the presumed wife or children of said peasant would remain in service of the baron, where they would be used as bargaining chips in the next card game. One particularly well-dressed earl was set to protest that his peers ought to stop gambling with the lives of their peasants, or at least use their own property to wage in their card games or dice or bourbon races or board games. But he said nothing for two reasons. First, he reminded himself that, in such case, peasants were the properties of the nobles, and gambling away the ownership of poorly performing service was a time-honored tradition. And second, their entire conversation was quite rudely interrupted when an incredibly large and incredibly smelly, dark-skinned, leather-bound man crashed through the doors of the Great Hall. 
Brutodar walked through the wooden doors, which were now freely opened up to him, and quickly surveyed the scene. The feast attendees, shocked by his presence, were plainly at a loss as to what to do to stop the Dragon Man. They quaked in fear when Brutodar dropped the head of his hammer, which in turn left a sizable crack on the marble floor. They gasped in horror at the unceremonious umbrage and impetuosity of the unkempt giant as he slammed his massive palm into an awaiting red berry pie and brought a large handful of the sticky dripping sweet dessert to his bearded mouth. He laughed, ha ha ha, in sheer delight as the red gooey liquid dribbled from his mouth then down his beard. He then noticed a selection of sliced meat on the table, which he then picked up with his other hand and shoved into his mouth without even the slightest common courtesy of first placing it between two slices of buttered bread. The king, still lounging in the small throne at the head of the hall, eyed the intruder surreptitiously and reasoned that he and the two well-dressed visitors were simply latecomers to the feast. And though the Hirschuit man, who was now attempting to eat an entire white sugar cake in a single bite, was making a considerable mess, it was not his job to clean up after him. That was what servants were for. Besides, the king had more pressing matters to attend to. Specifically, he sat in nearly undivided attention as he salaciously leered at a rather scantily dressed Mysterianese slave girl who was engaged in an interesting acrobatic dance for his royal pleasure. This would be scandalous in any other situation, as the poor lass appeared to be entirely too young for such a lascivious display, but since he was the king and she was merely a slave, the nobles at this feast, being at this point remarkably ignoble, made no protest. Sundra and Markadar made their way into the Great Hall, having erstwhile debated between themselves through Dragonspeak as to which one ought to deliver the message to the king. Sundra argued that she was the daughter of the Facilius, and therefore full of Asculapula by birth, whereas Markadar was only a prince by marriage being the husband of the queen's younger sister. Besides, she was a general and instructor at the Sky Dragon School. But Markadar countered that he was the king's most trusted advisor, and simultaneously the functional equivalent of a Lord Privy Seal, Prime Minister, and Minister Plenipotentiary to all human and elven kingdoms. Further, he was Grand Headmaster of the Dragon School in general, and the Headmaster of the Fire Dragon School in particular. Besides this, he was the Field General of the Red Dragon Army, which effectively made him the Commander-in-Chief of all Dragon Armies. This meant he was Slyndra's Commander General, even if her rank was not an honorary position granted to her because of her royal status. Even still, he relented and allowed the Princess to present the message, and in her present mood she was certain to make quite a show of it. Of course, Markadar was mostly trolling the young princess, or as the Dragonians say, blowing on her wings. This referred to the practice of gently blowing dragon breath under a whelping's wings when they were learning how to fly. This teaches them how to find strong wind currents to keep themselves in flight. As an idiom, it means to go to dragon, either physically or psychologically, so that they take some predetermined action or make an important decision. This was quite literally a draconian version of the Socratic method. In the instant case, as the lawyers like to say, King Jodar assigned his daughter Slender the diplomatic task of delivering the fateful message to King Tobias of Kay Sverish Castle that his kingdom would come under attack sometime during the following chapter. Her slightly older brother, a powerful fire dragon named Arkodar, was at that moment leading the small reconnaissance patrol of the northeastern coast of Midoriya. Her slightly younger brother, Soldar, was patrolling the hills and valleys of central Midoriya. These would be the most likely locations of green dragon activity, his majesty had reasoned. As my dear readers shall learn in later episodes, they never actually found the green dragons. What they actually found was much worse, at least for their human counterparts. They had at least three younger siblings, Sandra, Darren, and Miranda. These three were still enrolled in their respective dragon schools and would not have no part in the opening battle of this book series. However, they did have more important roles to play later, as my dear readers shall learn in episode 2. This left Slyndra, who was assigned to Markadar's group. Three other red dragons were currently patrolling the southern coast of Pasha. Markadar ordered them not to approach large human settlements in dragon form, but to switch to their human forms and to warn all humans they found of possible attack. They were to pay particular attention to the important cities of Delphia and Belltown, and the port town of Ichthos. There was a large army garrison in Delphia, and a college training school not far from Ichthos. These soldiers were to be warned to be on high alert. Interestingly, the brown dragon Brutodar was not part of the original plan. He was pressed into Markadar's service almost the very instant the ship arrived in the northern city of Dragonsport. A former fighter in the arena, where he was pitted in death matches against criminals sentenced to capital punishment, he suddenly had a change of heart and frankly stopped fighting mid-round. Since a gladiator who does not fight is no good to arena managers, he was sent to the docks. But once there, he did more damage than actual work, and his managers could not come up with a better place to put him. Forced by present circumstances to bring the destructive giant with them, Markadar hired a royal carriage to use his transport southwards through Midoriya and Pasha. 
Her Royal Highness, perturbed to no end at being cooped up within a large rolling box, much less that she had to share the box with Burugar, much less still that the Earth Dragon did not have the ability to hold an intelligent conversation, and even still much less that they had to travel on the Eastern Highway if they wanted to reach Case Farage in time, meaning that they could not stop and pay the respects of the old battlefield of Very Green Hill, which the princess was longing to do. Markadar's incessant wing stretching was too much for her to bear. Her patience having been taxed well beyond its fragile limits, she decided her entrance into the Great Hall of the Castle would be accompanied by a fear-inducing display of Sky Dragon powers. Her eyes shining a bright bluish light, she crouched down at the waist and cast a large electrified purple orb around herself. This orb, normally used at the end of very desperate fights as it consumes a massive amount of dragon energy, had the effect of lifting Solyndra a few inches off the ground. As she made her way into the room, her feet drooped down so low that the tips of her sandals slipped lightly over the tile floor, and small lightning bolts shot forth from the orb and hit sporadically on the walls around her. This caused the noblemen to scream in terror and throw themselves under the tables for protection. But one young baronet bravely poked his head back up, sneaked a quick look this way and that, and swiftly grabbed a plate full of food and brought it back under the table with him. Budodar, who had seen such a demonstration before, was largely ignored her and continued to eat a plate of porcine meat. Barkadar passively followed behind the princess at a safe distance, while the king leaned forward in rapt attention, his eyes wide. In fact, the only character in the Great Hall who did anything sensible was the dancing slave girl. She put her hands on her hips as she looked in shock at the deplorable actions of the noblemen who were purportedly her social and political superiors. The girl simply shrugged her shoulders, borrowed a fine coat to protect herself from the cold, and used the distraction to effect her escape. She ran out of the doors across the courtyard and out of the castle. She was halfway across the kingdom before anyone was even aware that she was missing, and by that point no one cared. Some say she became a milkmaid in a faraway village and married a young farmer, but nobody really knows for certain. And that, my dear readers, is how myths begin. Slender made her way to the end of the hall and stopped a few yards from the king's throne. She then cast off the purple orb, lowered herself to the floor, and ominously lifted her head so that her eyes matched the king's. A few nobles, who had the wherewithal to remove themselves from their hiding places, cast nervous looks at the direction of the throne. They waited with bated breath to see the reaction of the king. That concludes this segment of the Slender Dragon Eye, a novel perspective of the psychology of warfare. In the next edition, the Royal Magician performs a card trick in front of His Majesty to the light and amazement of everybody, except for His Majesty. If you wish to support my work, please purchase the original book from Amazon Kindle from the link in the description box. And for the more magical among you who wish to view more of my wonderful content, feel free to hit the subscribe button.